Twice a week, Van Lathan and Rachel Lindsay dissect the biggest topics in Black culture, politics, and sports on their show, Higher Learning. They discuss the most important and timely conversations while also frequently inviting guests on the podcast and occasionally debating each other. Check out Higher Learning on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, his Mark Webb Spider-Verse stock just hit. It's Andy Greenwald! The true webheads know, (laughs) webheads being fans of both Spider-Man and Mark Webb. And the World Wide Web and websites. Yeah. The same guy responsible for all three things. (laughs) Real Spider-Man fandom begins and ends with Andrew Garfield's movies. Andy, we're recording this on Wednesday to be released on Thursday. Today, we're going to chat a little bit about the Spider-Man trailer. I've also got a good recommendation for folks with HBO Max subscriptions I'd love to talk about. 100 Foot Wave, which came via my my lovely wife, Phoebe, who went on a weird surfing jag uh, in in my absence and is now like, it's all... She has been surfing? No, she's, she's just been watching surfing. a lot of surfing content. So she oh. watched Momentum Generation. She watched 100 Foot oh. Wave. So she's just been really digging that. But now I'm, it's all barbarian days over here, man. I'm just like, I'm out there looking at the lineup, catching sick breaks. Greenwald, what's up with you? What else do we have on today's show? Today, we also have an interview that I did with uh, the great Lauren Mayberry, who is the singer for the Scottish band Churches, Churches with a V, who have a long history with this podcast. This is Lauren's third time on the show. I was going to say, is Lauren Lauren's in the Zooks zone right now, right? Yeah, there are a couple people who are just they're just they're always in the mix and and always welcome here. She's one of them. Great singer, great thinker, great person, great conversationalist. And the new Church's album, their fourth album, Screen Violence, is out tomorrow, August twenty seventh. So I got to have a great chat with her that I'll set up a little bit more at the end of this particular hundred foot wave. But I want to start before we get Spider Man. I'm into this. See, Chris was. Listeners, I'm going to talk directly to you, you know, because I just feel like my, to who? my, usually I just talk to you, but okay. this time my folksy homespun brand, which, you know, which has really served me well, I'm a truth teller. Mm-hmm. And before we started, Chris was a little reticent to share, I think, some of this surfing love. And I think that it's really beneficial when we just pop off with stuff that we're enjoying that may have slipped under yeah, people's sure. radars. Because this documentary, I haven't watched it yet. I remember hearing great things, was kind of excited about watching it, didn't watch it. But when you made that connection just now, not just that Phoebe, who has tremendous taste, always recommended it. But I was remembering, I mean, I'm not even going to pretend that I should be anywhere near a wave, <laughs> not even like a surfboard. Like I shouldn't be near anything that is called a breaker. Yeah. But- when I was making Briar Patch, I really did admire this one dude in the camera department who's, I think he was like the, I think he was the focus puller. I'm sort of, I'm losing track of, of, of it, but it was, he's a guy whose job was critical, but not ever present. Sure. So he had a ton of downtime and, and, and anyone, Chris, you visited set, like a lot of downtime on set. And yet he was totally Zen, whether we were baking in a desert or whether we were uh, freezing on a night shoot until like four in the morning, always the same. 
And I wondered what the guy's secret was because he was always just sitting in his seat, just sitting in his seat. One day, you don't I think ventured, he was m- microdosing on mushrooms, and that's the, <laughs> that's actually what was going on. <laughs> well, I think he may have been, but that wasn't. That I think wasn't that was the secret, right? It was okay. additive. You know what yeah. I mean? It was complementary. I wandered behind him and saw that what he was doing under the hood of the of of his equipment was just watching surfing videos. Yeah, nonstop surfing videos. And it was a beautiful thing. And so I, I think that even though obviously a documentary about a very, very tall, dare I say, 100-foot wave is probably has, it probably has dramatic stakes, mm. there's something very calming about yeah, watching people so cleave through the water. We bring this up a fair amount on Rewatchables. And if people uh, love like, like the Rewatchables, we did Rain Man this week. But we oft- often talk about how the innovations in home tech like your tv your sounds your sound system you guys talk a lot about innovations in home tech well because we talk a lot about like movies from say like 1979 or 1984 that now look fucking incredible when you fire them up on like a 55 inch screen because when you're you're growing up and you're watching goonies on like the 12 inch screen that you're looking at or whatever or however big your tv was yeah on a vhs tape you don't really see dick donner's pure vision of cinema you You want to see cannon beach (laughs) <laughs> as big as possible. Lawrence right? of Arabia, Wide that screen. stuff for me, man. I yeah. don't want to just see. Don't don't put. Yeah, don't put those Josh Brolin in a box on me. Like let him let him be on a canvas. So anyway, I was just I, over the last couple of days. I've just been watching this series. It was released in July. It's directed by a guy named Chris Smith. And it for people who don't know, it's about a um a set of waves of, of a beach in Portugal called Nazare, which is sort of discovered or at least conquered by this guy named Garrett McNamara, who's like a, a, a big wave surfer, a legendary big wave surfer. And the series is essentially about the development of this spot as something that this guy hears about, goes and visits, starts surfing. His journey throughout like the surfing community and injuries he has to deal with and his family situation. And then on the other side, like the development of this area to go from an untamed, wild, natural beast of mother nature to a place that hosts competitions, which is where the series culminates. And it's, it's dope. But the number one thing that I have to recommend it is if you get to the end of life stressful, you get to the end of your day, you got a little bit of time on your hands. You know, what's cool. Yeah. Watching dudes surf waves. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Do you you have like an ASMR thing that you were like, I will always watch like someone chop garlic you know, on YouTube for like an hour or something like that. I used to, but I've I've slipped. I have actually been trying to, I love that you brought that up. I have been trying to find something like that. Uh, not too much success. Like, like for example, you know that I love, I love ramen. Big mm-hmm. fan of it as a yeah. food group, but also as a subgenre of like obsession. Like I actually find it very calming to like, most of my Instagram uh, follows, I would say it's almost evenly, there's a percentage of people that I actually know. And then it's like 500 contemporary abstract painters and 500 ramen hunters in <laughs> Tokyo whose posts I can't read. I find those two things deeply common. So wait, wait, so like, you say contemporary abstract painters. Do you mean like Rothko or dudes who are abstract painting? No, like young like people, today. like people who are our age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you're looking to cop. You're looking to, to glow I mean, up. And I would love to be, I would love to be in that. Uh, a gallerist. Class. No, no, no. I mean, I would love to. I would love to dabble. I would love to have that kind of freelance cash. Just be like, I'm going to buy some canvases today. I, I don't think I'm quite Well, if there, you want that extra guap, we got to lead with Spider-Man and not ramen. You're totally right. You're totally right. I've admit, I, I started this off air, like telling Kaya why art comes first. And now I'm like, actually, money comes first to buy the art. It is a terrible, vicious cycle <laughs> yeah. that I am trapped in. This is capitalism. But- all of this was to say, yeah, like I, I, I was like, maybe there's YouTube. I could watch people like walking. The closest I've come to it, because most ramen videos are just people I don't actually want to hang, hang out with talking about like pork back fat and being okay. like, that's sick, bro. I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> not, that's, that actually is making me sick, bro. But like, I did go through a phase and this is partly for research for a script I was working on, but then also it just found it very calming of like, there's a certain kind of travel YouTuber that I didn't know about. It's not just like I'm going to go to this island off the coast of Japan where X, Y, or like there, there's great kelp fishing, which is yeah. a video I watched. Highly recommend it. The dude is just like, 
I'm getting on the ferry at 5.40 a.m. instead of 6 a.m. so I can go pro through the entire boat. And then I'm going to sit by the window and you will watch me take this boat yeah. to Rishiri Island off the coast of Hokkaido. When I was going to like, Croatia, I couldn't believe how many me. videos there were where it was like Pleek Vika National Park. Here's a 90 minute video of my GoPro as I walked through it. I found that very calming. There's a video of a dude in like the coldest place in Japan. He's just like, it's really cold. I'm like, <laughs> I feel you, my guy. It looks really, he's like, look, look, this is the, the thermometer reading and look how cold it is. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it seems really cold, but I watched it. I find that calming, yeah. So I feel like waves actually feel more productive. The thing is that, it, that does happen. So when the, it, watching 100 foot wave and, you know, they some at times I think manufacturer not manufacture like stage the drama, but I think like they'll they'll sort of emphasize a storyline to make there be attention and release within an episode. But as I'm zenned out and as I'm just feeling bliss as I watch these incredible northern Atlantic sets crash against you know a, a lighthouse from the 1500s, you know once an episode it'll just be like, and here is a man. Mm who was tossed from his surfboard and is now falling down a 68-foot peak mm -hmm. spine no. first. And I'm just no, like... No, no. <laughs> and, no. and then they have like the dude like immobilized, and I'm like, I wonder if we can get a super cut of just the waves, you know? Yeah, like, he, <laughs> I feel like he's immobilized. Why not just like then push him gently back out to sea and shoot flaming arrows at him? You know what I yeah, mean? Like at right. least give him the Viking funeral on camera just for the way it'll look. And it's like, you, we're definitely in that zone again where we were last spring where you're just like, every time you cough, you're like, do I have COVID? You know, oh, and it's like, and then you watch yeah. this guy be like, I need to get back out there on these waves as he's like learning how to walk again in a pool. It's like, this, this really... I mean, makes and that's the way I feel when I see people going to live music concerts in August 2021. <laughs> I'm like, I don't need to go back in the pool. It's fine. I love... <laughs> I did my time in 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 the pool. You're I used not, to love. You're, you're not bands. trying to go see Julian Baker at the Wiltern. <laughs> it's, it's chill. You know what I mean? Like I get it. I get the whole thing, and I support Julian. I can't wait to see her live again someday. This thing, and we will get to Spider Man. I promise. But I'm telling you, Chris, this is what the real fans want. They want uh -huh. art. They want us reviewing videos of ferry rides. This is what the people clamor for. I I do think that. And I'm sure people can make suggestions for us of better options here. That I, I feel like there has to be something that splits the difference between highly dramatic and thus a little bit like anguish-filled mm -hmm. nature documentaries and uh, the Yule log video for 14 hours. And, and the reason I say this is, it's not just Paw Patrol. My younger daughter just loves animals and like becomes obsessed with various like she's like i i really like wolves and foxes and yeah. i'm like i like julian baker records that's cool like we yeah. all have things <laughs> that we're passionate about but does she know about like the circle of life though and how well so wolves this is foxes what this is what i'm getting at so recently she got really into meerkats does a great meerkat imitation because let me tell you I something highly recommend wolves and foxes aren't a minute's cap you know what i mean <laughs> You know what I'm saying? What do you mean, like in terms of how how long they're allowed to run? Yeah, I just think stage? like, like I, I just think like load management is a big thing for foxes, especially in like England, where they, they're like, oh they're getting subbed oh. out of this mortal coil pretty frequently. Yeah, because I think here like wolves, you know, wolves they are still living fucking, their best Jack London lives. Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah, like in but, LA, they're just like you'll just see coyotes. Just I mean, I know coyotes and wolves aren't the same thing, but you. They're, they're, For they are among us. They are. Yeah, and when right. you see coyotes in Los Angeles, they're not like, oh no, the dominant species. They just give you a look like, yeah, well, I'll be seeing you. You know what I mean? They're just like, it's not time yet, but they, they, they like literally with their paws do the thing where they point to their eyes and then point to your eyes, yeah. you know? Um, but so she's really got really into meerkats. And I was like, from the fogs of memory, I was like, I think, I think a lot of people were into meerkats. There's a show. Meerkat uh, uh, and, uh, Island, right? Manor. Manor, right. Check yeah. your alliteration. Uh, so Manor. So I'm like, this weekend, I was like, okay, let's 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 not watch this episode of Paw Patrol again. Let's watch Meerkat Manor. And she's super into it. And it's just, first of all, it's the great Bill Nye, one of the great British actors, narrating the story. It's just, it's just sonorous tones, taking it very seriously. And within minutes of being introduced to this group of meerkats and their this family unit, a matriarchal society, I'll I'll have you know, the eldest son named Shakespeare by Bill Nye. Mm-hmm. 
in attempting to defend the warren of like his many many brothers and sisters get savagely bitten twice by one of the deadliest snakes alive. Wait, is this alive. a documentary or is this... Yes. Did they... they like, scientists set up cameras and tracked a warren of meerkats and uh-huh. then later they, they edited it and, like, gave the characters names and, like, talk about their daily lives. So it's it's nature, but they... I would right. imagine if you went up to Shakespeare the meerkat and said, hello, Shakespeare, I'm a fan <laughs> of your work, he, would, he wouldn't speak because he's an animal. <laughs> It gets it gets blurry. But my point is, he is savagely bitten by a venomous snake in the haunch and face. Uh-huh. And the next ten minutes is Bill Nye being like, "The pain has become excruciating for Shakespeare. Yeah, the venom has paralyzed his his rear haunch." And you know, I don't think it's going to be a happy ending. I know this is how I felt when my wife, when Phoebe watched my octopus teacher, and I was just like, "I got to tell you, I do not think this teacher got tenure." <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, so, so, you know, I, I, it's a slippery slope. I, I don't. I feel like there should be a version where it's just like he then went to defend his family from the snake, and now let's meet other people. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, like you know what they could do? Yeah, Meer, meerkat multiverse. You're genius. Because then these meerkats, like they're not, they're not dead. They're just existing in a different reality. Not yes. unlike Spider Man. Kaya, pay this man. <laughs> I, I kind um, of like the idea that Kaya is just doling out our paychecks, kind of like the way the points work in Around the Horn. Like your segue right. was so good, you deserve to get paid this. Week. That's right, um, Andy. I have uh, a couple of questions about this Spider Man No Way Home trailer. So the, this the, is the, the the most viewed trailer ever or something in 24 hours yeah it's uh so if you guys want like very granular breakdowns and and Mm -hmm. and and understanding like the connective tissue i think i would recommend going to ring reverse i would recommend checking out mal just did a, a an instant reaction pod i think with van so you should check that stuff out like eddie and i are probably not going to be able to explain where exactly or how exactly all this stuff. I mean, Andy could, but I I think I would just glaze over. (laughs) Here's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because I I have been, as as usual, I've been thinking about Marvel a lot recently. Sure. Um, First of all, just my one take, I don't know if you have a general take on the trailer, but mine was, I bet this is the first 15 minutes of the movie. Because if it's not, they have shown quite a bit of it. You know, I know that there are like big reveals and there's a lot of casting rumors and, uh, relatively confirmed cast appearances of people from previous Spider-Man movies, like Jamie Foxx is confirmed. Everybody says that Garfield and Maguire are in it. I bet Willem Dafoe's in it. We get to see Alfred Molina in the. Um, is Hayden in the, Church in it? Hayden Church back? That was like a suggestion that and, yeah. and that 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 could happen. But uh, is, is is Jamadi waiting by the phone? I well, I just think that this is they get so deep into like what this what is going to happen in this movie. I was just kind of like. This must just be the setup of the movie, and then the rest of the movie is is like what we haven't seen yet. Do you agree with that? Yes. I mean, I think that first of all, I, I, there's a lot. There's a lot of business to pull this movie yeah. off, right? There's a lot of status quo establishing before it has to reach a breaking point that causes Peter to go to Doctor Strange to then unlock the rest of the movie. So I think in that sense, yes, this is all of the throat clearing. Here's what's going on. Here's why we are where we're at, where we're at. And then, yes, then it holds back on the full reveal of where we're at and how perilous and crazy and multiversal it gets. (laughs) I I just have to step outside for one moment and just say, it's crazy. I I saw something like, obviously the, 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 the super fans are, are getting everything they want here. And like, if you are a person who commented, who comments on a YouTube, uh, Alfred Molina is back. I got chills. I, I mean, I'm just so happy for you. You right. know, I just, I genuinely without judgment, if Alf, if 70 year old Alfred Molina strapping <laughs> on the metal tentacles for the first time in 20 years, like fills you with an emotional reaction, like chills. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you should listen to more Julian Baker. But second, <laughs> that is, that's great. Um, I just did see, and I'm not surprised to see this, but I did see, I think, numerous places be like, wow, after the events of WandaVision and the events of Loki and the events of this movie, buckle up for the arrival of the multiverse in Doctor Strange 2. 
Right. I'm like, kind of feel like we have the multiverse. Like, this isn't it? Is this still the appetizer? So this here's seems fun. Here is the this thing, is though. So I was I was just looking back over the list of movies. Do you realize that it pretty much took them eight movies to kind of figure out what this was about? Like yes. to get to get there. Like you mm-hmm. would if you go mm-hmm. back to say Winter Soldier, which I think there are good Marvel movies before that, and there are interesting Marvel movies before that. But Winter Soldier is where I feel like they kind of got their yep their tempo right, and they got the tone right, and they then started to introduce what I guess would be the. Um, the major theme of like that first block of, of those movies, which was mm-hmm. super heroism, but heroism and sacrifice and like great mm-hmm. power, great responsibility. And this idea that that's what leads to civil war. That's what leads to, to like all these different kind of schisms in within them. Story that started in the 1940s with some characters who were time jumped or, I mean like Steve Rogers was alive then, but also Tony Stark's father. And that this is a decade spanning story. Right. And now they're, I mean, I guess I, I guess it depends on what you consider the mm-hmm. the work they've already put in. So when you say that, and you're like, "Didn't we already start the multiverse?" Like, mm-hmm. sure, we did. And I think the difference now compared to 2008 when they started is in 2008 they made four or five or six movies, and I think they were still like, "Huh, what are we gonna? What's what's going to be the direction we go in? We have all these different comic storylines to try." Now everybody now says it's going to be the multiverse leading into Secret Wars, and that. Mm-hmm. I even saw some people saying like the reason why Benedict Cumberbatch or why Doctor Strange is seemingly like pretty easy peasy about like being like, yeah, sure, I'll fuck with time and space so that your girlfriend doesn't remember your Spider-Man. That seems like a great use of my powers is because that is in fact like he's being controlled by somebody or by who? Say it. Say well, the name. Is it Kang? No. People is are it back Mephisto? on their Mephisto bullshit. And the reason they're saying Mephisto is okay. Wow, this turned I- into Ringerverse. I, okay, a couple things. I'll, 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 I'll start not Ringerverse. I'll start just, you know me, ordinary folksy homespun guy mm-hmm. talking about waves and boat rides. Meerkat ramen hunter. I saw in this trailer, again, why John Watts is the guy that Marvel hired for Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. Because with the Russos gone, they clearly see him as the dude who can do this stuff. Not do it the way that James Gunn and Taika do it, which is we're doing, they do their own thing and they use the Marvel action figures in a way that's delightful and not, you know, contradictory to what everyone else is doing. But, you know, who is able to tap into the vein of actual emotion and pleasure that, you know, I, only zombies would aren't charmed by Tom Holland and Zendaya. Like, mm-hmm. I, I feel very fondly towards these Spider-Man movies almost entirely because of them but can also just pull off the action stuff in a way that feels plausible and whatever. And so that makes sense. And so I was a little taken aback. I mean, I know these movies were successful, but I, did, I, I didn't I did realize, I think I texted this to you yesterday, that the the Jake Gyllenhaal Spider-Man Mysterio movie, Spider-Man Far From Home, mm-hmm. which had a lot of fun things in it, but I don't think hung together nearly as well as the first, the Homecoming movie, is Sony's highest grossing film ever. Mm-hmm. Like Sony has been a studio for a minute. And yeah. that movie <laughs> where Jake Gyllenhaal is just like wearing a green armor suit. They're like, that's the one. Where it's just like Tom Holland in Prague being like, neat, got to go jump on a boat. That's it. So this is a very successful template and it feels stakesy and it does feel different than the TV shows or even Shang-Chi or the Eternals in that this is aggressively picking up right after not just the last Spider-Man movie, but after endgame and all that. So I, mm-hmm. I get that enthusiasm. It also does seem to be embracing with the cameos and stuff, the fun of comics in a very pure way, which is the, this doesn't even make any sense, but I'm so thrilled crossover. Like it's all in play. And I, 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 I love all that. That said, while I knew the multiverse was coming, I really did not see that Marvel would be rehabbing one of the most maligned storylines that they ever tried in the comic books. And that is a storyline from about 10, 12 years ago called uh, One More Day. And this came, this is one of those, you know, decisions never work well when they come from on high. And this is another case of it where basically there was a feeling that Spider-Man stories weren't popping the way they used to because they had written themselves into a corner. Because the the heart of Spider-Man stories is that he's young and he's screwing up and he's late for dates and he's late for work and he's, but Spider-Man in Marvel continuity was a 35-year-old dude who was married to Mary Jane. Mm-hmm. And like, just that was his life. And it was turning more into scenes from a marriage, frankly, you know, which I think 
is why we're getting that Oscar Isaac Jessica Chastain miniseries. You know, it's because it's Spider Man influence. It's, it's because it's of Spider Man. It's part of the Spider Verse. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, if so not, not, they, Ingmar Bergman was just like that. Was just the IP they could attach this to. Exactly. It was right. he Trojan horse did like he did all of his great work. <laughs> right. He, like he like his That's movies the that were sponsored. Next move, by the way, is to be like going to places yeah. and be like, I really want to take you know, 70s Cassavetes and use it as a Trojan horse to get my superhero story in. Like, yes, I don't want right. to do the the prestige drama. I'm only interested in Chris, getting like... No one ever talks about how Ingmar Bergman was bought and sold by the strawberry industry. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? He was basically like, I wrote a script. What fruit lobby will pay for this? And it turned out to be the wild strawberry lobby when it worked out. Um, anyway, so a bunch of years ago, they were like, we have to undo all of this. And we have to put the, the toothpaste back in the tube and make Spider-Man have a secret identity again, like in this movie. And also, a, a, anyway, it would undo the marriage to Mary Jane and kind of make, restore it to the status quo. And they couldn't just say, like, it's comic books, whatever. They had to have this whole thing where he, like, makes a deal with Mephisto, a.k.a. the devil, mm-hmm. and rebooted all the comics line. And so that's what they're doing here, right? Like, him having his identity outed at the end of the last Spider-Man movie has put those he loves in peril and so he wants a way out of it. And so then, of course, because nobody's ever satisfied with what they're seeing, off of a trailer, people are like, well, Doctor Strange wouldn't wear a sweatshirt. Right. That's Mephisto. Like, (laughs) I'm going to say this again. We're not getting Mephisto. (laughs) Kevin Feige knows that he he can have a purple-chinned Brolin be the villain and then humanize him because he's like, this is my daughter. I have very yeah. radical ideas about life, you know, and I want to well actually half the universe. Totally. I think he loses the plot if he's like, the real villain is Satan. <laughs> like, I think that that is not what he or the Walt Disney. This They wouldn't even make Nazis in World War II. They were like, well, it's secret it's Hydra. separate Nazis called yeah. Hydra. Relax. Right. Okay. It's not going to be the devil. But pivot. It's cool that, and in keeping with everything Feige has done in this version of Marvel, that they did attempt to find an emotional hinge to get to the story they want to do, which is Spider-Man pointing at each other, but Mm -hmm. IRL. That's fun. Yeah. And stakesier in a way that's in keeping with this version of the character that they've introduced with Tom Holland. I I, I have to say that I am, I, I remain engaged with this entire project. I am very, very curious to see whether or not the space time continuum stuff and the branches of time and what it, this is the he who remains from the citadel of fucking around with like the one timeline and then we're just going to have like multiverse and then we're going to somehow have i guess secret wars is all the different multi like timelines or realities fighting one another right i can't wait to see it i'm not i'm not trying to concern troll at all i think that for the layman not the lame if there, men. No, lame. if for 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 Tommy Lunchpail, who's working, you know, at a at a desk job, is that too much to was ask? He, was he on your little league team? <laughs> yeah, he was a backup third baseman. Uh huh. Good, good club guy. Um, you should I, have. I don't want to tell you how to parent Chris, but you should have your Ward Bryce meet with him <laughs> as a cautionary tale. You know what I mean? Like this don't is what put happens when hopes. you don't put in the extra work. Yeah, don't or take extra grounders. Baseball, you know, is a fickle mistress you know what i mean like you should concentrate on your studies too again i don't want to i don't want to tell you how to do your, your well, job. that's why i'm hoping to get him as, as like a full ride to like georgia tech so he learns a trade you know okay yeah i mean just you know keep an eye on the books bryce is all i'm saying <laughs> it's not gonna hurt you where was i i was uh, do you think that like I, so, so i want to say i don't know if like everyday folks will just right. be like i can keep all of the calculus of the multiverse straight in my head. But then if you go back and you look at the log line of like what Ultron's about, I don't really know that anybody was like, oh God, man, Sokovia, like what's going to happen? In fact, I will take the counter position to you. And I'll say the rules of the multiverse makes people's eyes glaze over. But you know what makes people's eyes widen with delight is Spider-Man's fighting all the Spider-Men. All the bad guys are here. Yeah. Great. I think that actually the majority of people who like this movie do not need to be, conf- they don't need to read the instruction manual why Jamie Foxx is fighting Tom Holland instead of Andrew Garfield. Sure. I, 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 don't, I don't think they do. You know, I think that that's, that's great. And for people who care that J.K. Simmons is playing J. Jonah Jameson again, 
then it's a fun bit of meta, you know, blah, 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 like something's up. But most people are like, yeah, that's that guy. That guy should be here because mm-hmm. we remember that ver- that guy existed in the Spider-Man movies. So yeah, I guess I'm, I, I, I find it really fascinating to think about the concept of casual fandom or casual I, I agree, engagement and whether or not that's possible anymore in this day and age. I guess this would have been like the question I really was going to ask at the beginning is, can you just be a normie person who's like, I basically get it and like these actors and will just engage with this? Or is the actual success of this whole Marvel project to turn all the normies into fanboys and to have normie like... People- not the the sexy Irish people from Hulu. Right. I just mean average. <laughs> not, right. I, don't, right, I don't mean... Marianne, what, Marianne, what do you think about the Sandman? Thanks. Thanks, thanks uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, well, did you uh, see? No. I, I, Alfred Molina's buck. <laughs> all the space you need for this one. <laughs> I got chills, Marianne. Excuse Alfred me, Mr. Molina. President! <laughs> Have you seen that Willem Dafoe is back? Willem Dafoe is so old to be throwing pumpkin bombs. Um, These are deep fakes, man. I, These guys are I, old men. They are not true. doing this stuff. <laughs> it's so true. Um, I think something that has definitely been discussed when these, because, uh, you know, we to give credit where credit's due, you might listen and think that we overthink this stuff or that Ringerverse super fans do. Like, in the corporate development suites, they are thinking about this 100 times as much. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I bet one aspect of the conversation that allowed them to use this Spider-Man movie as the real blow the doors off this idea storyline is that Spider-Man has proven itself to be the most mainstream and malleable of yeah, the Marvel yeah. heroes in the same way that Batman is in the DC universe. For the one reason that there have been multiple incarnations of both of those characters and nobody minds already, just mm-hmm. by the fact that they've been making those movies for a while. But audiences have happily accepted a third Spider-Man in this century, you know? So I, I don't think that people, there's a barrier to entry. Whereas, again, no one remembers this now. Not everyone remembers it, but it's not nearly as relevant now. But just saying, okay, so Iron Man and Tony Stark, and this is what motivates him. And, right. you know, going even deeper, like Black Panther or Scarlet Witch or all these characters that are now household names didn't come with that multiple decade of not just living with it and knowing the Spider-Man theme song, which is winked at in this trailer, but like we've seen other actors do it. We get it. It's like, it's, it's, it's our Hamlet, Chris. It's our Hamlet. <laughs> on that note, I think we should wrap up there. What a, uh, what a sad indictment of our times. Uh, we'll be back on Monday. We'll hit a bunch of stuff going into coming out of the weekend, but Andy, you want to set up your interview here? Yeah. Just to say that i um, so excited to have the chance to talk to Lauren uh, about a lot of things, including the her creative process and what she and the band went through with their last album, uh, Love is Dead, the things they learned from it, things that they wish they'd done differently, and then how all of that affected the recording of Screen Violence, the new record, which was then itself affected by COVID. This, they had to record the album remotely through screens. I just think the record is really fantastic, and it's kind of a one step back into the very band-focused songwriting that they were doing, but a big step forward in terms of the emotional content and the lyrics that Lauren is bringing to it. She's just, you know, you and I talk to musicians for a long time and rarely get, it's not always a lot of Mm self-reflection, you know, Uh, especially when, when artists are promoting something new. So it was really interesting to talk to her and to hear what she had to say about the band's journey, about her own journey and what you know, what her experience was with an album that was divisive for some of the fans and and what the new record is like. So thank you to Lauren. Oh, and we're also at the beginning, we're joking about something that people might not remember. But Chris, I don't know if you know this, but I used to have my own podcast. I um, I, I mean, some might say that the some. AG the AG report is resurgent. Some, and, some might. And, and operating that, within my borders. That podcast had original theme music written by churches. Yeah. So we, so she always obviously has a, a, a safe safe port in a storm here on this show. So um, let's get into my interview with Lauren Mayberry of Churches. We are produced as always by Kaya McMullen. Enjoy this interview and we will talk to you on Monday. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three month plan. 
The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. You're listening to the Andy Greenwald Podcast. This isn't one of those things where I'm like, I love the record, but for the purposes of my street cred, I'm going to hammer it. No, this is this is a safe space. Not like late night talk shows. I'm like, you can't love everything. You're just being really nice. Like everything. They're <laughs> like, oh, this is the best movie, book, TV show, song I've ever heard. Really, like, we get <laughs> Well, we get this a lot when people are like, why don't you, why aren't you mean about things anymore? And I just feel like we mm-hmm. made a decision that like life's too short. Like if we don't like it, we just don't cover it. There's plenty of things. That's a much nicer way to be. Like, I feel like. We all grew out of that era of life, you know? It's the same. I'm like, if I don't like something, I should move on. I just won't listen to it. I won't watch it. I don't see the need to, I don't know. But that's kind of interesting from a music perspective, because as someone who was a music critic like right out of college, like that was, Mm -hmm. fighting those fights was self-defining, right? Like that was the point. That was Mm -hmm. like, it wasn't just what you loved, it's what you didn't love. And you had to tell everyone why, why these things were better. And then growing older and still loving music, but I just don't want to be in the trenches anymore. I want to love what I love. Yeah. And I would say, I hope that music press has stopped being so much like that, but I don't know if that's true. I guess, yeah, the era you were working that in. And then like when I was working it a little bit later, Mm -hmm. I feel like that was a very specific time period of like a crossover from purely print to online and like, I don't know, like... It was a kind of exchange of, I don't know, it's almost like an exchange of power. Like it used to be that like, I can't tell who's holding the cards anymore. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And it felt like the very, like it was more like everything had to be super snarky, pitchforky in order to compete with what was going on. And I definitely had an appetite for that when I was in college. And then when I started working in music stuff, I was like, oh, that's what people want. So if I hate this record, then I'll just like slam it. And then I guess when I was like a few years after, I was like, I don't want to write about it if I don't like it. If I don't like it, what's the point of putting it in? Unless it's like yeah. morally repugnant. That's right. That's the same thing. As you look, when you get a little older, you realize no one's, very few people set out to make something bad. And the thing mm-hmm. that rankles is cynicism. If it's done from a, a, you know, a bad faith place, then maybe it's worth taking down a peg. But otherwise, they just didn't hit the marks. Yeah. And I can't tell. Maybe I've just run out of energy. <laughs> so I've gotten older. I'm like, but like for friends, I would rather that send them a too. link to something that I'm like, this is all amazing. You have to watch it. You have to listen to it. You have to read it rather than like, did you see this? Yes. It sucks. So it can't be bothered. I don't know. I, I, I feel like we've started. This may be part yes, of our interview, but it. regardless, people love it when it's just sort of the cold, like we just sort of warm up. Um, I'm so happy to be joined once again on the podcast. Third time, I think. Third time's the charm. I think, uh, Yeah. Third time plus repeated times as the voice of my currently on hiatus solo podcast, which I still owe you many thanks for. Um, the great Lauren Mayberry of Churches, welcome back. Hello. Thank you very much for having me, dude. It wouldn't be an album cycle if we didn't talk to Andy B. Malt, so here and are. what an album. I'm so excited to talk about it. Um, screen Violence out August 27th, I believe. On, mm-hmm. on Do I have to say things like on glass note? Like, are these, do we still say these things? I feel like very old They would probably like that. it if you did, but you know. They would I've enjoy done it. that. Yeah, they are. You're welcome. <laughs> Shout, shouts out to the team. So I I was saying to you off there, I, I love the record. I'm so excited to talk to you about it. And it's complicated origin story, which may not have been the origin story you and the and the fellows had planned for it. But I kind of wanted to start by talking about the fact that this is very much a California album, both because you were living in California when you recorded it, but also a lot of the subject matter takes inspiration from the surroundings or from the Hollywood legends that that live among us in the palm trees. And apologies for the slightly glib beginning, but in my experience, both coming here as a visitor and living here, absolutely no one on earth loves Los Angeles more than English people. And <laughs> like they, it, 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 it's almost like a, like a narcotic in their bloodstream I see when they like arrive at a hotel with a pool. I don't know how Scottish people historically feel about Hollywood other than the Blue Nile, who, as you quote on the album, talked about Tinseltown in the Rain, which is one of the greatest songs ever. So that's my only perspective. So as, as a Scot living here, what does this place mean to you? Or what did it mean to you before you came here? I feel like I had quite a complicated relationship with Los Angeles, mostly because when we would come, like I'd always wanted to go. It always seemed 
like you've seen it in so many movies and so many TV shows. It's just this kind of otherworldly place that you didn't think you would ever get to go. And then I guess when we did first come, it was for the band and a lot of that is work that we're really lucky to have. But, you know, I'm sure everybody can imagine there's a lot of... uh, there's a lot of shite bags. <laughs> I don't know if I can say shite bags on your podcast. You but, absolutely can. Uh, you know, like you play, and we were lucky enough that people were excited about the band, but then there's a lot of like baggage that comes along with that. So there's a lot of like talking to people after shows who clearly didn't watch the show and just want to like tell people that. And then ne- I have a lot, yeah, a lot of good dudes who I don't know coming into green, green rooms and like nagging me after my own gig. And I'm like, there's there no, there's no escape from this. There's no freedom. Um, yes. And then I think, I don't know, I guess there's a lot of more superficial things that are prioritized that I didn't love. And I always kind of felt, I felt like I was in like back in high school a lot of the time where I was like, oh, I'm, I'm dumb and unpopular and ugly and these things aren't like this is ah I don't want to think about these things I don't want this to be anything to do with my work I don't want to I could feel myself getting preoccupied with things I don't want to be preoccupied with you know yeah but I think that as I spent more time here not working and not with people that work in the industry I think it's been a lot better and like now I live quite far on like the northeast side and I just kind of feel like I'm in like a little village and I guess having been here for like all of lockdown when it, everything went away, then you, I wasn't in pubs listening to people talk about things that make me want to roll my eyes. I don't know. I wonder, I think Scottish people, which were, were just too, yeah, can't get into that level of like fluff conversation about stuff that doesn't matter. If you know what I mean? Like when yes. people are like, Oh my God, like, did you know this person and this person? What do you do? Who are you? What is this? And we're like, Oh no. Did you see this YouTube video? Here's a funny story about someone who got hit by a bus. Like that's kind of <laughs> where we're at emotionally. So uh, yeah, but the sunshine, I'll definitely take that. Martin from the band basically lives in like shorts and t-shirt and gym clothes all the time. He does the socks and sandals thing. I think because in Scotland you see sun like maybe twice a year. So he's just like, Ooh. <laughs> like yeah, it, I mean, that's, that's the thing that I think still fundamentally it's, Nobody, I don't know people who want more winter. I don't, I don't trust them so much. Like I've had plenty coming from the East coast. Like I got it. I get it. (laughs) I get the bit. I don't know. And I do think that if you can figure out where to land Mm. within all the kind of crazier elements of the city, it is a really creative place. There's so many people who want to do exciting stuff. I've never had more, (laughs) more people want to, especially for this album, like make weird shit for us and with us than in this town. So I feel like, if you can close yourself off from all that kind of superficial madness and you can actually make really cool work and yeah. So I'm trying to trying to be mature about it and uh, enjoy the sunshine and but don't enjoy it too much that you start making bad art, I guess. Yes, that's right. It, well, it can, it can be a very harsh light. It can reveal bad art as well, I think. If that you're a writer, see, you phrased it much more nicely I than me. used to be. <laughs> um, so what was the plan originally though? You were living here and clearly aspects of the album and what you wanted the fourth album to be were forming in your head and maybe some song structures and things, but was the plan always to record here or was the pre pandemic goal to gather together, obviously together as a band, but somewhere else, what was the original plan and how did it shift as the nightmare began? Well, we'd already, we had the album title before we'd finished touring the last record because it was a proposed band name that we didn't end up using mm-hmm. And there were a lot of terrible band names. We thought about band names for a really long time. And it, to, the, to the point that it was literally saying what you see, like you would drive past and you'd be like, street, street light, car, door. <laughs> we were just so desperate. That, that's the Steve Carell and Anchorman style of naming a band. I love it. Like I but, love Lamp. Yeah, because our, our friend who was our manager was like, we going to put a song on SoundCloud. So you got to have a name. If you're going to put it on SoundCloud, I want to do it on this day. And we were like, oh, we don't have a name for it. So, uh, Yes, but Screen Violence was one of the names that was on that. And we just thought maybe it was too too retro, too 80s. And if the band sounded a bit like that, people might think it's like a parody band mm. or something. So, but yeah, when we were like spring, summer 2019, we were starting to figure out what we wanted to do next. And I'm a big archivist, I guess. So I have a lot of the stuff from the early days of the band and I found this list of band names and that one jumped out to me. And I knew that the guys would like it because we all love that era of 
filmmaking and the scores that are in those films, like the synths that are in those soundtracks are the synths that we have. And it felt like we want, we'd made such a, the third album was so like bright and sugary in a lot of ways. And that's what we had wanted. But after you've eaten candy for a year, you don't want to do that anymore. So yes. And like, I guess the title seemed to me something that we could, I could write a lot of. And I think at the beginning, I thought it was going to be more full concept from my perspective. I think because I'd never really written anything like that. And I guess there was all kinds of stuff happening around the band that I felt like I wanted to make a record, but I really didn't want it to be anything to do with me or be about, I don't know. I think I liked the idea of not having to be myself, if that makes sense. And any Mm -hmm. of the baggage that goes along with that, I was like, I want to just write just write some stories because that's why we started doing this. But then as we evolved the record, it became clear that it was like, these are personal songs and it's just set against a backdrop with different imagery. So I think we always knew we wanted to make it ourselves. The plan had been, we would do half of it at Martin's studio at his house here and half of it in Glasgow at Ian's place. But we began the plan in like February 2020. So Ian came out here for the first part of the bargain. And then he ended up having to leave because everything was shutting down. And then we didn't see him again for a very long time. And we made it remotely um, via Zoom. And even though Martin and I were in the same city, you couldn't be in different households at that time. So uh, yes, we had to make it completely separately and work on like audio movers and file sharing and stuff like that. It's interesting to hear you say about the origins of the album title and also that for you initially, it was something that was freeing and external because when you first told me the name of the album, having not been in those initial pre-SoundCloud planning meetings, my immediate thought was, yes, that this is, I think I, I, I don't even know if I'd heard the first single at that point, but like, yes, this is reminiscent of, you know, early 80s horror films and things like that. But to me, it, it immediately made me think of what I imagine your life is like a lot of the time being an <laughs> online performer, particularly an, uh, a woman who, you know, who is a performer and lives part of her life online, just subjecting yourself to screen violence constantly. Uh, I don't know if that's a jump that you made initially or if that emerged later, because that vibe, I feel like, is, is runs through the album. Yes, I feel like maybe subconsciously that's what was happening. I can now look back on things at different times and be like, yes, this is like, not to sound dramatic, but process processing trauma and like um mm-hmm. like a emotional mental health exercise. Like I think that had we not had this record to make and had the time off to gain perspective on certain things, then I think that would have been quite bad. Just because, you know, like we're incredibly lucky to do what we're doing and I never want to seem like I'm complaining about something. And especially the world does not need one more straight white woman complaining about stuff, crying, woe is me. But you know, like it is a weird reality to live in. And I don't think that's so, so good for your mental well-being. And it had been like nine, eight, nine years or something. And uh, yeah, there was like just a resurgence of that kind of stuff in the springtime 2019, which I think I've always been very bullish about things where I'm always like, no, we don't cancel stuff. We don't, we have to keep going. We're going to do this because if you stop, you show weakness. And like, I think that's a good thing because... That you know, it's a this part of the reason why we get so much done, I suppose. But then I can look back on that time and like, yeah, the the wheels was definitely starting to come to come off the bus emotionally, like mm-hmm. uh, just odd things that would be happening. And you know, like it's easy for people to say, oh, it's not real; it's just on the internet. It shouldn't bother you. But your your brain doesn't make the human brain does not make the distinction that hundreds of death threats on the internet are not real things. Like you mm-hmm. can't. If somebody says, I'm going to come to this show at this time and do this, and people are like, oh, probably won't happen. That doesn't really, doesn't really help your, your brain, you know? So, yes, I think it was, your, your brain just kind of goes into like fire drill mode and you like yes. keep going and you get it all done and I think that's great. But it was just weird things. Like I remember being in a hotel and waking up in the nighttime and I'd like piled a bunch of stuff in front of the door. I don't remember doing, which is quite odd. And there's nobody else in the room. And I was like, hmm, either somebody came in and played a strange elaborate prank on me or something is going awry in the old brain box here. Um, yeah. And yeah, just strange, like this a song on the record called Violent Delights that opens up the first verse is about a recurring dream. And that was, unfortunately for me, I think that did happen for a number of weeks was I would have these same two dreams over and over again. 
about uh, my partner's dad dying. And then the second night, he would have tried to go find him. And for some reason, he was in the water and then nobody could find him. And then he died. And I was like, why is everybody doing this? Why is my brain doing this to me? But then after yeah. a minute, I was like, hmm, maybe something is not correct <laughs> upstairs. I have to figure this out. But uh, yes, it was during that time period. So I suppose it was only like a month or so after all that stuff was happening that the screen violence idea happened. So mm. I kind of look back on that. I'm like, I think you were still wandering around in a bit of a funny days, but like a certain part of your brain must have been engaged enough to be like, I want to do this. And even if it was purely concept, I'm sure that would have been very cathartic. But I like to believe that the part of my brain that's actually in charge was like, this is going to be good. She just doesn't know it yet because she's oh. off her rocker. <laughs> well, well, but without question, because that, I mean, I think the best art comes from that. It, you, The part of you that moves forward and, and gets things done was selecting the right box to put mm -hmm. something a little more uh, vulnerable or tender into that maybe you weren't even fully in touch with. And I think that's the thing that I found so impressive and moving about the album because the style, the aesthetic, the conception is fantastic and consistent. But one of the things that I wanted to, to talk to you about today is, on some level, this struck me as a singer-songwriter album. And I don't mean to discount, um, obviously, Martin and Ian are not present on this podcast, so I can pretend that they're not here, but they are equal <laughs> members of the band. But yes. um, in all in all ways, but there is a, I guess, a, a through line to the lyrics that I noticed that is I wouldn't say it's different than the previous albums, but it feels it feels more focused in some ways, you know, and it feels from song to song and throughout the project. And I think that there's a confidence in the songwriting on coming from all three of you that allows the stylistic flourishes that you were mentioning at the beginning to come through in ways that feel like they're totally under your control. I mean, you were mentioning how the 80s synth soundtracks, you know, were were inspirational. There's a moment I I'm sorry, I don't have the track list in front of me. I can't remember if it's lullabies or the or or, or even the last song. When suddenly, like, there's a, just a tangerine dream. Uh, oh, film. Yeah, yeah. It just it just, it just <laughs> drops in, and it's like there it is. It's haunting the album, but it's not defining the album. It's not it's not just the costume you're putting on, you know. Um, and I, I guess somewhere in there is a question related to at what point did you start to feel compelled to take the dream that was confusing or frightening you and put it into a lyric to you know, to, to, to make the jump from personal uh, and to external? Hmm. Um, well, I guess the first song we wrote, first two songs we wrote were He Said, She Said and Good Girls, which I guess probably have the least horror -y imagery in them, I would say. So maybe those were the most like previous era writing style, I suppose. And then hmm. I think the next thing that got written after that, the next two were How Not to Drown and Violent Delights, which are probably two of the most horror laden things that are in there but yeah I guess I knew that I wanted it to be like have a piece of imagery in each song and we always knew that as we maybe when we'd written about half the record we were conscious that we have to make the sounds and the world that we build around it feel fun and campy to a degree and like escapist because otherwise it's just a list of sad fucked up things <laughs> it's just not we're like hmm if you write there's all a market this for down, that yes it's just a very sad book so i'm like we need to like <laughs> make it more and i feel like that's but that's what we've always wanted to do is find that balance of having things be fun and not too serious and have weird samples of was talking that we forgot to mute and things like that but take the other parts of it seriously. And yeah, I think once we got to, so yeah, how not to drown, like it was based off a demo that Martin had already. But when we got mm -hmm. to the lyrics of that, I was like, oh, okay, I think we're going here. And yeah, I do think it was maybe because 2019 was such a uh, intense year for the band and maybe getting a bit older. And I've definitely been friends with and dated people in entertainment that I kind of... You, not that you analyze somebody's life when you're with them, but I've definitely been near people who are at a point in their career where they're like, man, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd done certain things differently. And I, I think that that scared me a lot, honestly, as a passenger in those situations being like, man, if you want to do something, you just really need to do it as soon as you can, because when you're too far down the road, it's much harder to make those changes and, or have people believe that you can do those things. And not that I think that I've written, I think that Church's lyrics have always been quite personal and quite emotional, but there's definitely mm -hmm. some album tracks I listen to and I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> this is a collection of images. What are you doing? Which is fine. Like, I feel like that's, there's definitely a space for that. And I think I was conscious 
coming from a more like indie alternative background, I was mm-hmm. like, well, this is an electronic project. This is synthy. So it should be different. So I think I was trying to write not as narrative stuff as maybe I had in other spaces, but sometimes there's some album track. What was it? There was an album track from the second record that came on shuffle the other day when I was trying to make a set list out of songs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Pfft. I remember writing this song. <laughs> this is just, and the guys were like, aha, uh-huh, that's what you want. All right. At the time, because I was so stuck, I had such profound writer's block. I was like, here are a series of phrases that technically fit together and they seem like they could mean something. But I know that I wrote it after watching an episode of Friday Night Lights because I couldn't think of anything else. Like, so, you know, oh, I that, feel like that's the album track called Saracen. Right? That's... <laughs> Oof, I mean, I wish. We, we what finally a dish. figured it out. Um, but yeah, so for this, I don't know, like during 2019, I think I really went back into things that I love as a listener and I'm like well what I know this sounds dramatic but it's like if your creativity gets taken away from you in one way or another whether that's this all the mad stuff that was happening in 2019 or last year when the band doesn't really exist because nothing exists what do you want to write and I feel like I've always really loved stuff like like Nick Cave or Jenny Lewis and like Connor Roberts and that kind of storytelling lyric but I've, I, before now I've been like oh I wouldn't that's not what we would do. It's not what we should do. Uh, people are going to think that it's pretentious if I tried to do that, which is just, again, seals the stuff in the brain box working against you. Cause it's, yeah. It's tough to quiet those voices, but I, I hear you. And I, and I think it's, I think you were triumphant on this record. And, and, and it, it, you know, it reminds me of something yesterday where I was thinking about what I valued when I was younger, listening to artists who were impossibly old, they were probably 28 or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, coming from an indie background, like you value opacity, right? Like, I don't understand that. But that must be because they're older and they're smarter than me. And these images are doing something. And and then yesterday on Shuffle, like Tom Petty's Wildflowers came on, which I remember thinking was pretty when I was 17 or 18 or whatever, when it came out. And I'm like, this is so powerful and deep. And I will always love R.E.M., but I feel like Michael Stipe never wrote this song. Do you know what I mean? And there, was, there is a confidence in it that I think that I value more now. And I guess I I do want to talk specifically about some of the songs, but I guess just to keep it in the realm of the process for a moment, um, I, I wonder if this is a narrative that you would recognize or agree with or feel free to completely blow out of the water. But the first two records, which you guys primarily made yourselves, were, you know, were of course personal. Every All songwriting and art making is. But... The third record, Love is Dead, we worked with Greg Kirsten. And as we were saying before we even recorded, consciously was you were you were widening the lens, right? And opening up the songwriting um, mm-hmm. in a way. And what I loved about this record is it felt like lessons learned from that experience were brought back into the core trio in a way so that songs could have that ambition, frankly, you know, but also be extremely true to what how you were feeling, the three of you, and what you wanted to say in that particular moment. Thank you for saying it like that. That's such a, uh, what we hoped would happen. That's such a great way of talking about that. I feel, yeah, I feel like the third album, the whole point was that we were going to learn a lot. The whole point was to try something different. And I'm sure that part of the thing that motivated us finding an outside producer was because so many people to our faces and otherwise have always been like, imagine what churches would sound like if they had a, a big producer, if they had access to the resources that these people do, imagine what record they would make. And the only thing that's stopping them is not doing that. So we were like, well, let's go see, let's see. And we did like so many, right. Like so many writing days with so many different people. And, you know, like we did days with like Justin Tranter and Julia Michaels and Benny Blanco and like all those folk and we learned so much from all those sessions but those songs didn't make the record and when we worked with Greg it was like I've never been in a room with somebody that's who's creative like that like he's so intuitive and like he's the best player I've ever seen and like his, his he has an encyclopedic knowledge of all all music and I feel like when you're in a room with somebody like that you're challenged to elevate yourself to kind of be in the zone and be in the space so but definitely Ian and Martin, they're super feral about that stuff. Whenever they go in, they're secretly side-eyeing all the gear and writing down the settings and everything. And just, you know, not in a rude way, but if you're going to go in and use the vocal chain, you want to know what the vocal chain was. So, yeah, I feel like it's everything you do, every session you do, even if it's terrible, you learn something. And I feel like the guys took away a lot of things from that. And I took away a lot from that in terms of, 
what I loved about it and what I think I could have done better. And I think for me, it was the the storytelling that was lacking on that record. Like I think in theory, people are like, what's this record about? And then I'd be like, it's about this. But then in my mind, I'm like, there's three songs about this. There's two songs about this. This is about this. The thing that bothered me was I felt that my job, I hadn't made it that coherent, if that makes sense. And so that was my main theory going into this one was I wanted something that felt felt like not a book necessarily, but once we'd started writing it, I was like, I want it to feel like there's a through line through everything. And like, I don't do any of the production or play any of the instruments or, and most of the time the melodies will be in place on the demos when the guys bring them in. So I was like, if my whole job is to write the stories, then I should push myself to write better stories, I guess, or more thought out stories, I think. I hear that. I, I, I mean, I, I have two thoughts. One is just, I think, continually the story that never gets told by whatever's left of the music press in general is like with any artistic enterprise, your experience of this is process. You know, it's always learning. You're always making, you're always thinking and reflecting. The casual fans interaction with it is product. Oh, this is, this is, this is churches in 2017 or in 2021 or whatever. And the connective tissue is just not a part of it, but that everything that you make is a step towards the next thing you make and steps go in different directions, I think is part of the reason. I mean, that, that, that's a level of music fandom that has always compelled me. To the other point about just like learning tricks and a confidence in them and then the integration of them. I mean, as someone who has felt like most bands do and probably should spend their lives chasing the beat drop in Clear as Blue um, <laughs> to get to Violent Delights, which I think might be my favorite song on the record because of the storytelling, as you're mentioning, but then also they like brought in the one dove drums, you know, it's oh, just yeah. like, yes. It's, Break beats in church songs is a thing we didn't expect. <laughs> oh my God. And it's so, but it's so exciting. You know, it's both, it's all the words that you've been using throughout our conversation, but coalesced into it. It's fun. It's surprising. It is pulling an influence and in tribute to the spirit of the band, but it, it, it suits the material in a way, you know, it does feel, it just feels cohesive in, in a way, in addition to being a devastatingly good song. Thank you, man. Like, I feel like that's something that the guys were definitely talking about, like, and something that I think we did a lot more on the first record and maybe not so much after that. Not on purpose, but I think just because, like, you know, this band was never meant to be successful. We were constantly shocked, <laughs> shocked and amazed, but terrified. We're like, oh, God, don't scare it away. Like, don't chase it off. Like, everyone, just be still. Keep doing it, but don't, <laughs> not too much, but not not enough. Ah, but I think that, at the that beginning, sounds Scottish when, to me. <laughs> maybe, yes. But yeah, there was less, not that we were less precious with things or I don't know, but there was, you know, there's a sample thing at the beginning of Recover that we just left in and it's me being like, oh, I think it's a bit tuny. I don't know. And that's not even a word. And we left that in. And, you know, things like there was a dodgy sample on the first record that we had to fudge enough to get it over the line. And it's not, I don't really know if we did it. And I think, yeah, it was about kind of the guys definitely were kind of trying to channel that headspace on this album and be like, if we are doing a song that's definitely inspired rhythmically by the prodigy, can we get like a kind of nineties glass smash sample in there and things like that? And yeah, I feel like for me it was just like sending myself into a little one woman writing workshop kind of because the thing I took away from the making of the third record is that of all the rooms we went into and all the sessions we did and all the people we worked with not one person talks about lyrics like mm. ever other than this hook bit when we were we did this on Miracle with Steve Mack and he uh oh, people know him for working with like Ed Sheeran and Shape of You and like that space and I definitely learned a lot from those sessions because he talks about it's kind of like the say what you see thing in pop writing that I wasn't really familiar with. He's like, at this moment in this song, when the instruments open up like this, it needs to feel like this to the people or phonetically it should sound like this and it should land here. And I've never thought about lyrics like that. So I learned a lot from that. But other than that, nobody talks about lyrics in pop writing sessions at all. Cause it's about, yeah. it's just more about how it fits with the melody and what it feels like. And sometimes people, when we've been writing for other artists, they'll be like, it needs to feel like, big and emotional but not personal and big and dumb and hooky or whatever but in church's sessions and like the guys kind of were able to elevate their work in a way that there wasn't necessarily I've never really had a lyric writing brainstorm partner if that makes sense so I was mm -hmm. like it's just gonna have to be you 
and yourself inside a room when you're going to have to get get the Leonard Cohen like lyric notebooks down and read through them and be like, what's good about this and what's bad? Like, what have you done that isn't this? And like, not that you're trying to do an impression of other people, but just maybe it's because I come from like a more academic background. I like a bit of, like a bit of study. I like a little homework and be like, how have people done? What are lyrics that I love and why, why do I love them? What is it? about it and sometimes it's alliteration that's made it more pointed but it's like what they're saying and how they're saying it so i don't know that sounds very dorky uh, but no not at all and, it, and and you can hear it play out in the album and i can hear um well i mean we've talked about this in previous interviews but obviously you're a fan of pop music and you've, you've gone through this pop academy over the last few years but also as we've discussed previously there's a bit of an emo background to some of your tastes and things that, that is yes. saying this as gently as possible because we're both very sensitive but um <laughs> What I loved about the record lyrically was the the lyrics can be quite lacerating on the record, but there's a duality to them because obviously the uh, target of he said she said does not come off super well, and that's brilliantly <laughs> not, constructed. Not the best, no, not no, not the best look for our our, our mate. But um, this album begins with asking for a friend, which is incredibly savage, pointed inwards. You know, mm. and I think there's a song later, and I, I apologize, I'm paraphrasing you, which is never great. It's quite um, right. It's like wearing a shirt, a band's shirt to their concert, but the band's shirt is spelled wrong. Um, <laughs> but you, I think at some point you refer to the songwriting, or, the, or at least whoever, the narrator of that song, let's say, as like revenge poems or poems of revenge. Oh, um, mm. There's, it, it, it's a, there's, a, there's an interplay that I love where a lot of the album is about the role, or even the design, the aesthetic is about, you know, women as victims on the screen but the person holding the microphone in these songs sometimes sounds like the killer or at least is holding the knife and i thought that was a very i thought that was very artfully explored throughout the record and wondering about in that writing process how, where you kept your camera pointed because often it seemed to be turned back inward ultimately thank you i'm glad that that worked all right but yeah i don't know i guess i'm sure a lot of people can relate to this that uh, well, nobody thinks that I'm a bigger piece of shit than I do. <laughs> like that's just how life is. I don't know. And I like the idea that there were these songs that could be, I guess at this point, churches for me is like, it's almost like two, I have to I have two personalities kind of, because when I go out and have to do interviews or do a stage show, like I, since the second record onwards, I think I was like, I need to create something that's bigger than what I am because that's not enough for people or that's, not shielded enough for me and you know it was a learning about what performance is because on the first album I was just so terrified of everything I had just been quietly playing keyboards in another band and then this was happening I was like oh my god like in an amazing way but then you know you're in the same position in a band as all the people that you've loved for years and years and years so people will expect you to do your version of that and I had no idea what that was so I feel like I had to go away and create that sort of and especially on this record I did like I dyed my hair blonde and the styling is different because I wanted it to be part of the the stories and I wanted it to the songs to feel like they're about the final girl scenario but if you look like a screen queen and you can take the tropes from horror and apply them to mm -hmm. the show what does that feel like so I feel like some of those songs are written with that kind of character in mind trying to be like I feel like yeah, the church's persona is always like how I wish I actually was. But then in real life, I definitely let people walk all over me. I definitely take <laughs> shit in relationships, you know, like definitely do all those things. So I feel like especially asking for a friend because the guys had already made most of the track, I think, at that point. And I tried to write like three or four different sets of lyrics on it. And I was like, no, it just felt like it was making it too, too cheesy or too like like dress up sort of when I tried to put it into the more sort of character. So I was like, maybe it just needs to be, I like the idea that it's just a list. It opens with a list of things that you don't, you really dislike about yourself and you know that you're terrible. At. And I think that that's an important thing to be able to do as a writer. If you're going to turn the pen on somebody else, you have to be mm. able to turn it on yourself. Otherwise you just seem pious, I guess. I don't know. I, absolutely. I, I just think it takes, um, it takes more than I can even imagine to have your, voice be your instrument as it is in this band but then to go along the lines of what you're talking about to make yourself the instrument as well to you know the visual component is a portion of it you're also entering a pop arena where that's as you said you're standing on the marker on this giant festival stage where people you've mm -hmm. idolized 
who appear, although everyone, of course, is probably terrified at some point, but people who appear to have been born to stand in that spotlight have been standing. Do you feel like, and I'm sure a year at home has not helped it, but do you feel like you've gotten better about managing that, uh, the toll, you know, be keeping parts for yourself and also being able to, you know, feel strong and use the parts of you that you want to use as the visual component of the band? I feel like if anything, the third record was actually really helpful for that. Not the writing of it necessarily, but the touring of it. Cause I think that was the album of ours that I didn't necessarily perform as well, like critically or sales. Mm. And like, it was definitely, it was definitely, we did fine. I'm not complaining, but you know, like when we were touring it, it was definitely a sense of like, okay, we're going to need to push this along to keep this moving. And then I don't know, there was more time and space to kind of analyze how people were feeling at the shows. And that was the first time that I kind of had a realization that none of this is really about me. It's not about you. Like, yes, people on the internet or people who don't know you very well will look at you and analyze you based on what you look like and what they think about you and blah, blah, blah. But people who actually love your band don't love it because they love you. They love it because they love the songs. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a really helpful like wake up moment for me. I was like, people aren't really coming to the shows to see me necessarily. They're coming here to experience a show because of the music they love and what it means to them in their life. Like you're almost just like this backdrop that they're projecting their feelings and onto, if that makes or, sense. Or the vessel that's. Yeah. Like you're delivering them this right. experience. And I think that made it much easier for me to kind of separate it out because then it's, it does, did make me feel a lot less self-conscious because I was like, all oh, right, like you're, these people are providing you a community because they're, taking the music into their lives, but you have to then play your part and like, you know, facilitate that for like 90 minutes. And yeah, I think that made it a lot easier. And in terms of like the, the performance and the character and the styling is I like the whole band has always been people talking. I've never been made more aware <laughs> of my gender, my body, what I look like all those things than when I've been in this band. So those things are part of the conversation anyway regardless of whether I put them in and whether I use them. Right. So, and I did like the idea that you can take the idea of this gaze that's being put on you and you can twist it and put it through another lens and send it back out. And I don't, yeah, at the beginning of the band, I was very conscious of like, oh, I don't want to, if I wear, because at the, the very start before we were signed, I would wear like glittery face paint to shows and it seemed fun. And I loved Annie Lennox and Karen O and that's why I wanted to, like do a poor, poor man's version of. And then once people start to notice us and like comment on that, I start to feel uncomfortable and I'll say, oh no, mm. oh no, this is separating me out, but not in a way that I want. So I was like, if I don't wear makeup and I wear baggy flannel, <laughs> then people will take me as seriously as they take the guys. Cause I write too. And it doesn't work like that. But I think it's interesting that if like Robert Smith or David Bowie wears stage makeup, it's a credibly creative thing that they do as part of their character. But if a woman does it, it's assumed that unless she's Lady Gaga, it's assumed that she's done that to be attractive and right. mostly to men. And I think that that was something that I definitely internalized. And also I can't have people thinking that's what I'm doing. So I have to just be one of the guys, but I'm not one of the guys. So I shouldn't have to pretend to do that. So like now I'm like, I think it, it's part of it. It's part of the fun of the storytelling for me and for the people that come to the shows and love the band. And why shouldn't you try and build a fun universe around a record? God knows everybody could use some escapism at this point. Me, like it was escapist for us making it and hopefully it'll be escapist for people experiencing it when they hear it and online and all those things. I'll wear glitter makeup if I get to go to a show again this calendar year. You know, year. just I, a I, tiny little blonde wig on top. Whatever is appropriate or not. I actually, maybe better not. <laughs> um, the album ends with a, a really beautiful song called Better If You Don't, which, you know, I think when people hear it, it may, maybe on first pass, be like surprised that this is a church's song or on a church's record. And in some ways, it makes me think of bands that you and the guys were in prior to churches, more guitar based or, or even more indie bands. Um, it's a beautiful song. And it really, the sentiment behind it really hit home because, you know, coming off of, as we all were, you know, a terrible year of being stuck. And then finally traveling again. And, you know, I, I'm speaking to you having just returned from an East Coast odyssey of seeing family and things and being like, no, 
still feel the same way here, you know, know, projecting this feeling of home. There's a lyric in the song about feeling particularly lonely at home, right? And I feel yeah. like there's, it's a really interesting place for the record to end because so much of the first half of the record is about, well, there's actually a lyric about dying in California. Um, yes, it's and, literal, but it's also Lost Boys. <laughs> it kind of is. So uh, I, I guess I just wanted to talk about that that particular emotion, which I found a very powerful way to end the record, which is wherever, you know, I guess on some level, it's wherever you go, there you are. You can't really escape mm. the things you're, you're dragging around with you. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that one definitely originated from, Martin said it was like a rainy day here, maybe three or four months into the pandemic and he just had been he'd been building guitar pedals and messing around with a lot of those and I think he just naturally started playing something that felt like what maybe we would have done in previous bands Mm -hmm. and then when I heard that I was like like, it made me feel like that and feel in that space and also the song feels like Glasgow so it should be about Glasgow in some way and I don't know I feel like anybody who's not even of a certain age, but just at a certain point in their life. I'm like, there is that whole, like, you can never go home again to a place, but to a time, if that makes sense. And that you can't go, like somebody, my partner said something to me the other day and I almost had to just lie down on the floor and like process. I'm like, no, 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 no. He was like, well, it's the thing. Money can buy people anything, but they can't buy you by time. And I was like, oh, oh gosh. Savage. <laughs> Don't just say these things and get on with your day. But, you know, like, and I think that's, why so many people are obsessed with we're obsessed with aging because we're terrified of dying we're obsessed with change like the, we don't want things to change we don't want to move on because we're terrified of the, things going to their inevitable conclusion but I don't know like I liked the idea that you can write a love song a love song to your home that's got a bit of realism in it you know and yeah like I think I definitely w- will move back there at some point but it's just it's such a small it's so, a so small place and there's only so many bars you can go to. And I think knowing my personality, I was like, even if there's only one person in the pub that knows that you're in churches, that's, it, it, I think emotionally, I'm like, I just need to not be in context sometimes, if that makes sense. Because then Absolutely. the sensation of being watched, which I guess is something like the record I feel is about voyeurism in terms of being watched and watching people and that feedback loop. But I think for my own mental well being, I'm like, okay. I'll go back. I'll go back when the band's been dropped and then it'll be fine. <laughs> and then everyone will be like, oh, she thought she was so fancy and we all wanted to talk to her. Well, now we don't. So, and I never want to feel ungrateful for those things, but it's, I guess it's odd when it's like your, your home and the pubs you've been going to for 10 years and the, the people that you've played in bands with for so long, like everything is different. Like you are different to everybody. It's not, everything changes anyway. But now when I go back, I'm like, oh, everyone's married. Everybody has kids. Everybody has a house. Everybody what have I been doing? <laughs> like, you know, everybody has that sensation of like, what the fuck? Where did all the time go? What happened? Like, I don't understand any of this. So, and it has the Blue Nile reference, which seemed cheeky. Like, I, I wanted it to be like a cheeky nod to who are our sonic and emotional forefathers, these guys. I also think you're potentially selling yourself short because as you said earlier, you could go into most pubs in Glasgow and per your description, everyone in there is just watching YouTube videos of people getting hit by buses. <laughs> so they might not have time to look up and notice you as long as the bus accident. Yes, as long as there's one the number particular, remains high. particular YouTube video. Uh, if, you ever, if you ever want to see it, yeah, just look up fuck's sake, Ali, A-L-L-Y, <laughs> and you will see the one that I'm talking about. I looked it up afterwards. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> But whenever I drop something in the house, I'm like, fuck that, Holly! And I have to redo this YouTube video. So so just to to wrap up, I, I guess, you know, when the album was, you're beginning to plan the album and record the album, obviously the world was in a very different place. And what those of us on the outside of the music industry thought a band was and what a recording session or what a tour or what a promo cycle, what all these things looked like, they were all fixed a certain way. Now we are semi-emerging, blinking into whatever this is. Where are you and and the guys with it? How are you feeling about this launch, potential you know tour dates that I'm sure you know are, are announced, but in the future and everything in the future is an unknown. How are you feeling about it, and where are you with what a music career means at this moment of 2021? I mean, incredibly grateful to have it, like incredibly comforted by it, if that makes sense. I think last year was a really as much as it was completely terrible for everybody in every way, it was a good 
wake up call, I think. And then we were like, well, what is the purpose of a band? It isn't to be on these release cycles and to hit these marks. And you're doing all those things because you want to be able to keep making music. But ultimately the band is quite chaotic in your life a lot of the time. So last year it was nice that every day when the world is on, falling apart, you get on Zoom with your two friends and you either make some tunes or try and make some tunes and shoot the shit. And like, that was very, it became a very like grounding, comforting thing. And I think that's been a really good thing for all of us, like emotionally and team bonding wise, I suppose. But uh, yeah, going forward, we're just trying to figure out, we've all, we're pretty far into the making of the next one, just because what was there to do? There was nothing to do. Right. We finished, we did the masters for uh, screen violence in December. So we've been just sitting on our bums this whole time. So we're pretty far into that. And then today, today is actually the first day of rehearsals. But uh, yeah, we're trying to figure out like there's a COVID, COVID protocol and the COVID uh, compliance officer that's going to oversee everything. And I think the theory is that it'll literally be once you're in the touring party, you have to go if only everywhere together and nobody out, nowhere outside of this space. So I think for the tours in the fall, because we have friends who are on the road already and have already had one person in the crew test mm. positive. So then you have to shut it down for 10 days. And yeah, we were like, we need to just really, 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 really try to keep things on the road. So it's going to be like in venue or in bus only. No, wow. you're going to get arrested if you go to a cafe because that's illegal. But you know, like I think if this is a way that we can safely put on a show for people, then that's what we that's what we should do. And it'll just be like back in the day when no one had any money, so they couldn't go. In, <laughs> you couldn't go outside the venue or the van because you didn't have any money to go anywhere. So just play it like old school van tour day. This will be, be a really, really fascinating challenge for bands that hate each other uh, going back on the road. That this we will see some we will see some things, or maybe we yes. won't see them because they will implode after one week of not being able to run away you from know? each other. I mean, at least we had that year long therapy session <laughs> where we're right. like okay now we can stay in a green room and in a bus only uh for this whole time and it'll be fine i think that'll be good but i think it'll be really good bonding i think everybody will be a lot like everybody will we'll just be extra grateful for every show and we really want to keep it as safe as possible so that we can do all the shows and make it to all the places because i need a show i haven't watched a show in so long and i think right. that we want to do do that a good job for people. So I hope so. I'll go to the cinema another time. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You've waited this long. Why, you know, why start I, now? Yes, we've waited. We haven't played a show since December 2019. So I'm like, I can definitely do this for five weeks, six weeks. So I'll be fine. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. I look forward to it. Um, I only feel bad that generally when we've messaged, it's been about television shows that you're <laughs> watching. And I feel like you have to come back sometime to drop your spoiler theories or conspiracy theories or finale predictions of shows that you're watching because that's but normally what we time. talk about i'll have a lot of time on that tour because can't go outside so yes I'll call in from the tour bus and just be like shows and be like here did you ever watch the second season of twin peaks it's pretty weird I'm like, did you, <laughs> that's that's an evergreen observation that i'm here yes. for <laughs> yeah. absolutely true um well lauren thank you so much screen violence is really fantastic it's just an exciting chapter in this journey that I've been really a big fan of watching for a surprising number of years now. And thanks for always coming and talking about it with me. Thank you, dude. We always really appreciate it. <laughs>